Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike like Clayton here from XY Advisor chatting with Paul Giannotti. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks very much for having me. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we were discussing, I was discussing this with Emily the other day. You are like the Justin Bieber of XY. <laughs> and, and by what, what I mean by that is... Such a, is that a compliment? It's, it's or definitely not? a compliment. <laughs> it's either Justin Bieber or Selena Gomez. One of them has like the most followers you know, on, on Instagram. So, because, and what, by that, I mean, in, if you go to discovery on XY, xyadvisor.com, if you go to discovery and it says the top courses and the top communities, and you're like in the top for both of those. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, That's so, great. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it might be Cristiano Ronaldo. Maybe he's got the most followers on Instagram. <laughs> I, can, I never really know, but you're like the, uh, well, Gary V says, whenever a new platform starts, you should jump on. And if it goes anywhere, great. And if it doesn't, then who cares? But if you start early, then you end up being uh, the number one. So yep. that's, that's the, when, when we sort of look at XY being an extremely infant stage of, uh, of where we're sort of headed. Um, and you're the first sort of standout um, from my mind. So uh, congrats, first of all. Awesome. Thank you. Now, that's the exciting thing is being part of the community, trying to build it up. Um, and it's that going back to that whole no like and trust ability thing is getting mm. to know people delivering value and um, just being there over time so that when they're ready to take the next step, you know, they might give me a call, um, talk to our team and, you know, see how it goes from there. A hundred percent, man. I mean, the strategy is so straightforward uh, and for the advisors that do it themselves, it works really well. And hmm. basically we like to buy in, in the exact same way. We just want to make sure that we know who it is we're talking to. It used to be that you had to sort of go into a meeting with someone. You didn't quite know who they were mm. and they had an hour to convince you, right? Yeah. So to tell you everything about themselves and then, hey, become a client. These days, it's like, no, I want to spend a couple of months or years, figure out who the hell you are. And then we'll, uh, when I'm ready, we'll go from there. And that's typically how people now purchase mm. things. Um, and it's a lot, it's, it make, makes the whole sales process a lot easier too. Cause you've already built that trust. They know, they know you, they like you, they know what you're about and you know, you don't need to do the convincing. It's already been done. And you can also often move some of that, the sales type strategy stuff, the discussion before even having the call. So they, they're even more pre-qualified to want to work with you. So that when it comes to the call, it's just like, all right, what are we going to do? Yeah, no, yeah. 100%. In fact, the better your marketing uh, strategy and, and process is the smaller your sales strategy. So if you, mm. you've got to get someone from zero to a hundred, if you've got a really good marketing strategy, you're getting them up to 99, you just got to like literally just shake their hand and they're like, hey, exactly. I'm a client, right? So, so uh, yeah, a, a lot of this stuff I've learned uh, after funnily enough, because uh, when I used to have my practice, I had a pretty good system set up, but it was not great. Mm. Um, and I've learned so much more since then. What's your, what's your connection with financial services? Um, do you have a background in it or have you just decided to nail financial planning as your marketing speciality or what? Yeah, it's kind of the latter. Um, over the last three and a half years, I was working managing a digital agency with a, with a partner before I went on my, off on my own. And we work with a lot of professional services, a lot of financial advice guys, got some great results for them. But I guess it's like a bit of a selfish thing in that, I came to a point in my life where I was trying to sort out my finances and I was reading a lot of books on, you know, investment strategies, what I'm going to do for my retirement, planning everything, getting everything um, all set up. And I just came to realize the value of financial advice. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I've got the skills for it with, um, you know, getting good results for these guys. Why not get the best of both worlds and work with them as well, get to pick their brain, understand their best strategies and learn at the same time. So it's kind of like a bit of a win-win. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, yeah, basically if you can learn while uh, improving someone else's business, that is a, that's, that's absolutely a win-win. And especially cool. if you end up becoming a specialist, I mean, that's fantastic. So walk us through, if you would, sure. um, what your high level strategy is for advisors to get new clients. So it, I start to look at like, the low hanging fruit first. 
So that's generally like someone actively searching. So if you think about the levels of awareness, you've got a large part of your potential clients who are unaware. They don't even know they've got a problem. They're, you know, they might be your ideal client, but they don't even know they've got a financial advice problem or let alone that, that they need to see an advisor. So they're unaware. Then there's people who are, uh, know they've got a problem and then they need to f find a solution for it. So they're looking for solutions to the problem. Then there's people who are aware of the solutions and they're actively understanding the strategies and comparing the solutions. Then there's people who are looking at the actual providers who can deliver the solutions and comparing those and then making a final buying decision. So it's kind of like understanding that pathway means that you can build strategies to um, attract people at different levels of awareness. So at the tip of the uh, tip of the spear are people that are actively searching. So you usually start there first because that's, I guess you could call it the most qualified traffic that you can buy is people going into Google, actively searching for putting in buying keywords for the topics that you're, you know, deliver service to. So if someone searches financial advice, Sydney or financial advisor, Sydney or best financial advisor, Sydney, you know, those are really, that's really highly qualified traffic to buy. And you want, you definitely want to advertise to that and, and own that as much of that as possible and not let it go to the competitors. Mm. So you start there. So, then it's looking at those two channels. So it's you're splitting search into pay-per-click and then organic. And you want to be on both, obviously. Like I talked to clients and we'll bring up, we'll actually just bring up the search results page and then you'll, you'll see the ads at the top. Often when there's a location search, you'll see the, um, the map and then you'll see organic listings. And you want to basically own as much of that real estate as possible. So you don't want to pick one or the other. You want to do both. Yes. So, go into ads and also work on your local SEO, work on your SEO to try and rank in organic and ads is often a faster solution. Like you're going to get immediate results and SEO can be a longer term play um, that you have to may maybe build up your, um, your level of uh, domain authority and, and the content on your site and everything to, to get into um, the top rankings on organic. So I kind of like start there. Um, but for those that are listening, if they're looking at uh, search, uh, you know, you want to look at the conversion pathway. So if you're advertising, um, you, you know, you're obviously advertising in a, in, a, in a vacuum. So you're having to look at the competitors as well. So one really good uh, exercise to do is open up the search. So you type in um, financial advice, Sydney, and then look at who else is competing for those keywords. So, you look at their sites, look at their pages, how well they're optimized for conversion. That's often one of the best, best first steps is optimizing the conversion pathway to get people to book in that appointment. So you, you can just look at how well is your, your page, like where are you sending traffic to? Is your homepage optimized for conversion? You know, if you open up the top performing sites, you'll, you often see big phone number at the top, uh, click to call, or uh, book in an appointment or book in a 15 minute Q and A and they're driving people to convert. So you want to make sure that basically you, you want to look at all the be best pages and steal the best elements of everyone and build a page that's better than everyone else. Mm. And same goes for your ads. It's like, how good is my messaging? Well, what are the competitors saying and what, which one would I click on and why? And you know, can I steal bits and pieces of the, of the best and create the ultimate ad? Same goes for the landing page. How, how well is it optimized, create the best in, in the market. And then, yeah, how, then looking at the rest of the process, like how, how well is your thank you page optimized? So often people will say, oh, thanks, you booked in an appointment and that's it. But yes. that's a great opportunity to keep building the trust, build, keep building, like you could have a great video there that goes into how, what it's going to be like on the call, what to expect, why, you know, why we work with people like you, um, you know, and use that as a trust building uh, process. Definitely, man. Um, so, I mean, it's what you've just said is make sure you're doing the basics well. And the good news is this Australia is so big geographically yeah. that in, in, in the, probably the majority of geographical locations around Australia, there's no one even playing that system. You know what I mean? So there's probably so many advisors out there that, uh, with a very with a very small amount of effort get a a big return on uh on that effort 
Mm. Um, it always, yeah, I, I, that was something that I just didn't do well. I didn't do the basics well. I, I kind of, I, and, and if, do you remember what it's like before you understand marketing? I do. I really remember what it's like. What, because, what was it? Because I started learning it when I was like 18 or something, 19. I was reading copywriting books and stuff. Well, there so. you go. So I, I had no idea. If, if I was to, I literally opened my first financial planning company at 29 and I think 360 days or something. I had, a, wow. I had a couple of days up my sleeve before I was age 30. And I knew exactly zero about marketing. Zero. Mm. And where I started, there was a, there was a small marketing budget that we were allowed to use uh, to, for marketing. And so I bought golf balls with logos on them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I had no idea what, 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 I mean, what did you do with them? I threw them out years later. <laughs> it, it, okay. because there was absolutely nothing to do. It, it, I had no idea what the point of marketing was when I, since learning the point of marketing is to create, uh, a relationship with with as many people as possible, scalable relationship, so that they feel comfortable enough to buy from you. I, mm-hmm. I, had, I had no idea. I, I I I looked up marketing in and I bought the first thing I saw. You know, it was really really bad. And so uh, I've only since learned since leaving financial advice, funnily enough, and working in a tech company now X Y. It is all of these things are so much more important than I anticipated. So doing the basics right is, is super important. It's something that not everyone does. Um, if you move outside of those that are actively looking, how yep. do you get people to, uh, uh, I guess, attract or be involved with uh, an audience that is uninformed, let's say, and not looking or... Right. Or we can change it. We can divide it into two that know they have a problem but aren't looking and maybe they don't know they have a problem and not looking because I'd imagine the people that know they have a problem but not looking are easier to attract. So there is this like natural re- relationship building process that we all go through that we just build, build um, trust and build comfort with people over a sequential time. So that's about uh, how do we um, allow them to engage with our content and then give them an op- option to subscribe to learn more. And that's either using a lead magnet, and that's actually a topic that we're going to cover. I'm not sure when this podcast is going to come out, but we're going to do a web class um, on Thursday about how to define and build uh, a lead magnet offer that converts. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so we're going to take people through how to create the hook, understand what we're offering, the, the pieces of technology that we need to use to um, to, to get people to convert, how to, how to tie it all up um, with the platforms and automate it all. So that's a, that's a really good way. Um, offering a, a, a newsletter is a great way as well, like allowing people to subscribe to your newsletter, getting them onto your social channels, um, building a group like Adele's talking about, building a Facebook group or it could be a Slack channel or anything else that allows people to learn more about you. Um, the, all, all of those are ways of basically getting allowing people to put their hand up and say, Hey, I'm interested. I want to learn more about you. Um, but I want to do it in a way that's not risky. So like booking a call can often be perceived as risky because you're not sure, you know, you might be embarrassed just about your finances and how, how, and that could be stressful enough. There's a million reasons why someone wouldn't see a financial advisor. I've put it off myself for 10 years thinking about it or buying books. So you want to figure out a way of getting them into your circle of influence and, and, being able to nurture them over time. And it's often just about just the idea of keep showing up, like keep being, keep showing up, keep being visible. And when it's the right time for them to take action and you've delivered a lot of value over time, who are they going to call, you know, who are they going to turn to? They're going to turn to you because you've already developed the relationship with them. You've been giving them lots of value and it goes back to that. I'm not sure if you've read that book, Robert Cialdini's, I think it's influence. Oh, I have. Yes. And one of his laws, the law of reciprocity. Yes. So if you give something to someone, they're much likely to want to give back to you. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a great strategy. It's that Vaynerchuk's idea of left, 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 left hook where you're giving, 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 and then you ask for something. Yes. I got stung by reciprocity in South America once. Uh, <laughs> this lady came and we jumped off the bus, three gringos, and this lady comes up. She goes, oh, 
here, let me carry your bag over to the place that you need. And we were like, ah, oh, thanks. You know? Mm. And then we just bought whatever she was selling. And then later on, we're like, <laughs> why did we buy that thing? Oh, reciprocity. Yeah. Anyway. The monk, those, um, the, the monks do it really well. They walk around and give you a book. And then they say, hey, would you like to donate? And you're like, (laughs) you just feel obliged to do it. So we're kind of like using that. Deliver a great amount of value over time and then they're a lot more likely to want to talk to you first when it comes to taking action. Yes. Um, So if we think about it, and again, if I go back to my financial planning days, I Mm. would pay for a Facebook ad. And again, it was really unsophisticated, but it did work to a small extent. And, and it would simply just email me uh, someone's name and an email. It mm-hmm. was as simple as that. It was that, I guess, rudimentary. And yep. I, I spent a lot of time on the design, a lot of time on all this stuff, but I wasn't even giving away anything, right? Mm-hmm. It was just, it was put your details in here if you want amazing advice or something, right? It was, it, I'm uh, surprised it's... anyone even bloody put their details in. Yeah. But, um, but they did. And, uh, and I, I got occasional clients, but obviously the better you understand the purpose of the journey for how people come in, the more, the better it is. So, uh, I would say, uh, as someone who, as an advisor, just simply, uh, going out and connecting with as many people on LinkedIn and then consistently putting out content is, is such an easy and free way and free kick to get in front of so many people. It's It's great. It's amazing that more people don't do it. And then, Mm. and then the other one is, and this is what we were talking about before we got started is the podcast. The Mm -hmm. podcast is an unbelievable tool um, to get in front. I I get, I get messages like LinkedIn messages. I would say once a week just from people and we're not, we don't even sell anything. Right. Mm-hmm. So all, all we say is, Hey, join uh, XY advisor if you're an advisor and that's for free. Right. So, uh, we're not even selling anything. And yet people always, I'd say once a week, send me a, a thank you because of what they're learning via the podcast. It is such a great tool and it's cool. I'm starting to see more and more and more advisors are now launching their own podcasts, which is right. really, really cool. Um, but in it, if you, if you simply, and it, I, I think like long form is almost overdone now. Uh, we were so worried about everyone having such a short time, you know, uh, headspace to concentrate on things that we created this long form content. But now it's almost like mm. long form is overdone. I've heard before X, Y, I guess for 45 an hour, Kate might be a little bit too long for people. I'd love to see someone punch out a 10 minute daily podcast. Just mm. boom, boom, you boom. Know, you know, you read my mind actually, because I was th- also thinking about, I've been experimenting a bit with LinkedIn lately as well. And actually, just from putting out daily, um, daily updates, I'm getting people saying, jump on my live um, thing. I'm going on a podcast next week with, a, uh, sorry, a webinar next week with a guy from Finland and his big audience. And th- these are just happening from me posting content every day on LinkedIn. So that's a really simple, easy way for people to, being just keep being visible Who, who's so, the guy in finland uh dr anton and I, I would murder his last name if i tried to pronounce sure, it sure 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 um but uh is he yeah, a I've financial got, advice at us no he's okay. he's a content marketing guy okay i uh but i married just, a finn so i'm always super oh, okay. interested yeah 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 i've got a very good friend from norway as well and who's in the marketing circle so we know, know a few people around around there but um but yeah, it's amazing when you start putting out content and just being visible, how many different opportunities come about. Definitely. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What, uh, one thing I've been doing that's worked really well is on a Saturday, take two, two hours, grab a coffee, set, turn everything off, all the notifications off and just write and write a couple of, write all my updates and then I'll schedule it in for the, um, for the week so that you don't need to spend your working week thinking about what you're going to write and everything. It's all scheduled and set up. And then it just gets posted. Yep. So quite a good way of doing it. And it's quite fun just on a Saturday going and writing and getting it all done. And and then you know that you've got the week of content covered. Um, One of the things I saw you write the other day was when your clients are lying awake at night, worrying about things, that's what you should write your content about. It was something really short and simple that I thought 
that is 100% on the money, 100% on the money. So I come from a um, background of doing paper ads and Facebook ads. And you, you kind of got to think, going back to your question before, how do you attract these people? Um, search is the lowest hanging fruit when people are actively searching for you. But then all the other channels are kind of, you make the distinction between search is fulfilling demand. It's basically like a pointing, like a, a sign on the side of the road saying, hey, you're searching for this, come here. Uh, we've got something for you over here. But then everything else is demand generation. And you've got to it's sort of, you could call it interrupt, interruption marketing. You've got to interrupt people on Facebook, on, uh, on their, you know, they could be cooking dinner. They've got text messages. You know, they're scrolling through feeds. They're doing their, their brothers, sisters, husbands, kids, new baby, you know, like cat videos, all of these things that are grabbing their attention, thousands of messages a day. So you've got to speak to the, the things that are, the compelling things that people have issues with that are, that are driving them. And it's usually, you know, problems that they can't solve and their dream that they want to achieve, but they, they're getting held back from things that are viscerally bothering them, um, tapping into those things and showing that you understand their, their problem their, where they're at. Um, I've been really loving this. I don't know if you've read the story brand, the, the idea I I have a hero's I've, journey. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. Is it new? No, the guy uh, written by a guy, a guy named um, Donald Miller. He's a screenwriter and he went at some point he was going to market his business and he's, the story goes, he went back to his cabin and he, he went through so many different stories and identified this, what's called an archetypal story at the hero's journey. And he found it in books, in ancient stories in all the, like so many of the movies. And if I tell you about it now, you'll, you'll probably get it because it's such a hardwired story that everyone um, connects to. So it's basically, you've got the hero who has a, who has a problem, a challenge. So it's usually an external challenge, like an enemy or a force that they're doing battle with a problem or an internal problem, which is usually self doubt. And um, can I be the person that I want to be, or am I good enough? And that's really, really quite an important one because everyone feels that way. Everyone identifies with that. And that's the internal challenge we all go through. So the hero has a, has a problem that's present, preventing him living his dream, but he meets a, um, a wise guide. The guide gives him a plan and then he uses the plan to, um, to do battle and, and live his dream basically. So mm. if I tell you like the classic story is the Star Wars story. So Luke... Um, has a problem. He's fight, fighting the Empire. He doubts himself and his ability as a Jedi. He meets Yoda, who is the guide, who is the wise, authoritative guide. And then he, uh, he gives him a plan, which is the Force, and then he uses the Force to conquer and become a Jedi and, and live happily ever after. And this is represented in so many different books and stories that Hollywood uses this because we're just hardwired to, to tap into this storyline. And you can apply this to your own marketing, what we see often is so many businesses that they position themselves as the hero. So they, you go into their website and it's all about how many accolades they've got, the awards they've won, you know, look at our office, this is our team, how good we are. And that stuff's important, but it's not the stuff that really, re really matters to the prospect, the person that's looking at it. They care about themselves. So then it works so well with financial advice is that you position your clients as the hero and you are obviously then the wise guide. And what do you do? You give them a plan, which is the financial advice plan. And, mm. and then they can use that to, um, to overcome their challenges and live their dream. And so if you think about it like that, it makes positioning your messaging so much easier when you focus on the ideal client, their, their position and how you're going to help them live their dream. Yeah. I mean, now that you say it, it makes a lot of sense. It, it, it is amazing that every, and I, I'm really bad at this, uh, making what it is that you're so focused on, which is your company, the hero, whereas mm. you should be making the other people, the hero. I mean, as right. soon as you say that, it's like, yeah, oh, duh. What, uh, what's, mm. why was I, why was I promoting Hill Ross Silverstone? I should have been promoting the fact that Hill Ross Silverstone can help you achieve what it is that you want yep, out of life. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then it makes, it makes the, your marketing easier because it's not then about you, but more about 
how do you understand the, your, your clients, what they're going through, showing that you, you vibe with that, you get them, you understand the problem, and then helping to define the problem and then showing them, you know, then also talking about why you're, the guy, why you're um, qualified, that you've done this before, you've helped people like them before, and then here's the plan. And you can use this methodology through your website, through your mess messaging on email nurture sequences, even on videos that you do. You can even split it down into diff the different services. So you might have a little story like that for each of your main, main services that you offer. Just makes it a lot easier when you shift the focus from you and promoting myself to helping how I'm going to help the other person get what they want. Yeah. And so how long have you been doing, you said you were reading this uh, at copyright 18. How long have you been doing this for now? So I had a bit of a, like an unconventional uh, career in that as soon as I finished uni, I, um, I left to travel, went through South America and basically traveled until I ran out of money, ended up in London. And I was really lucky to nab a job at a, at a really good digital agency at the time. And I started doing um, Google PPC ads, the pay-per-click ads that we were talking about before. And I just fell in love with marketing then. I was about 22 then. Uh, and it, the art and science of it, because you could, the art comes in, you, you're writing the, you're sort of like, and also armchair psychology. You have to understand what people are thinking, feeling and believing that would compel them to take action and then try and write the right words that connects that up. So you can write different hooks, the, the descriptions, the, the copy, and then you can set it up and run it. And within a couple of days, you get the data back and you know what's worked and what hasn't. So that's mm. the science part of it. And then you can very easily split test and, and learn over time what works and what doesn't. Um, so I got into that. Uh, but I don't know if you've been into London before, but the winters there are horrible. I lasted one winter. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, ah, I've got to get back to Australia or get out of there because I, I just love beach and, and warmth. Um, Came back to Australia, I worked for a, I got a job at realestate.com.au and had a, um, had a good, good three and a half years there, um, worked my way up there and was doing da data and um, audience um, segments and supporting the sales team in, um, in helping them do pitches to our big clients. Uh, but at the time, my ex-girlfriend had, um, uh, she said to me, hey, I'm going traveling. Like, I'm, I've never done an overseas trip before. I'm going, are you coming with me? And I was like, oh, got a good job here, good op opportunity, but, you know, I bugger it, let's do it. So we sold all of our stuff, booked a one-way ticket again to Chile and then spent six months travelling through South America. Ended up in, um, in Mexico, in Playa del Carmen, which yeah. is an hour, hour down the road from Cancun. Yeah. We just fell in love with that place and, uh, and decided to stay. So then I was like, all right, <clears throat> we've got to figure out how to do something here. Uh, so I went back to the copywriting books and studied everything again, uh, spent a, six months there building a little portfolio of work. I worked on my, my dad's business and some friends and family stuff and got, got together a little portfolio, built a website, started running some Google ads to the website, people from Australia searching for copywriting, copywriters, digital copywriters. Lo and behold, got some clients. I was getting a couple of clients a month and some referrals and built a nice little business from that. Uh, and it, it, at some point my old business partner hired me for a job. He was running a digital agency in Brisbane and we, we r really got along well, saw the world in the same way. Uh, and he, he then hired me. We ended up working every, every, every new client that he got on. I was on the, on the, um, on the job and I ended up partnering in the business with him and managing that for the last three and a half years. And this is something I just left about six months ago, but, the awesome thing is what I love. I mean, I love personally love to travel. So this, while managing that business uh, and that agency, I was traveling and living in Asia for uh, in uh, for one year there, one year and a half. I lived in eight different countries and did like two months at, at a time in a different country. Slow, slow traveling and experiencing like what life is like for a local there. So it's the beauty of digital. You know, as long as you people, I've probably worked with say 50 to somewhere between 50 to hundred clients being overseas. And as long as you do a good job and you've got great communication and you're getting the results, people don't really care that much where you are. Of course, so it's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. The freedom that you can have around that is, is awesome. Uh, we, we have our, 
at XY, the majority of our um, workforce is remote. And I noticed just recently that, that Twitter and Facebook are, are doing the same thing. After, yeah. after this COVID nonsense, they're like, well, if you want to work from home, Although I did read in Forbes that Facebook said, uh, look, if you move out of Silicon Valley, we're going to pay you less, which I thought, ah, <laughs> brutal. But yeah, you know, right? such is life. Um, cool. So ultimately, people are coming in, whether they're informed or uninformed, searching or not searching, but your goal is to get people into a, let's call it a funnel. Mm-hmm. How are you managing that funnel? What's your favorite piece? Do you just simply do really rudimentary like I was doing where I would receive an email with the details or is this going into a sp- like a Google sheet that's maybe a little bit more sophisticated zap- zapped in, for example, or are you, or do you like to um, get it sent to maybe a, a sales piece of software like pipe drive? Ha- where, where is this information going in? Yeah, generally into a CRM, a marketing automation CRM or platform. Um, if you want to do it simply, you look at something like uh, MailChimp for just basic email marketing automation. Uh, I, I really like and was a, I'm a partner agency of Active Campaign, so that's a it's a basic CRM, but it can manage your sales pipeline. So you obviously want to once a call comes in and gets booked, you want to use something like Zapier to connect up and then add the opportunity into your sales pipeline so you can manage, you know, all of your leads. The best thing is have um, what we talked about before where people download a lead magnet. That's someone who you would consider to be a marketing qualified lead. So yes. they've put their hand up and said, Hey, yep, I want to learn more about you, but I'm not quite sure or whether, whether I'm ready to become the book a sales call or book in a, a discovery call or whatever your first sales step is. So you need to figure out a way of nurturing those leads and making sure those leads become, uh, you know, or, or how, how can you upsell them, um, encourage them to book in that call. And so we do that with marketing automation and also been really using the, the, the weekly email as well. So if you're producing content, you might produce content for your blog that can then get repurposed as an email and that should go out to your, all of your list. So the prospects that have downloaded lead magnets, people that are thinking about becoming customers and your clients as well and just delivering value with that. And that's, that's a great way of sharing your expertise, but it can also get really good referrals because on the, on the bottom of the email, you might say, Hey, if you really, if you enjoyed this, please send it to someone who you might, who might find it valuable. And just another way of being, being wet, um, being visible and, and staying on top of top of people's minds. Um, one of the things that we've tried to embrace a lot at XY, and it is difficult because it's still relatively early in its progression, is video. Mm. Um, so we do a lot of what's called Marco Polo internally, which is an app. It's free. I always highly recommend this. And the reason why I was a big fan of Marco Polo is because I'd always considered Snapchat um, difficult to use. But my thought was if you could get your mate, like your business mates in a group Mm. could send Snapchats to each other, which would be a really quick way of everyone, uh, you know, staying informed rather than email, right. And rather than Slack, but mm. for whatever reason, I could never convince anyone to get onto uh, Snapchat and use it. But then this other program came around. It's called Marco Polo. And it's exactly that. It's, it, but it has no social media element to it. So there's no, there's no wall. There's no engagement or, or anything other than just simply you create either one-to-one or groups and you press a button, you talk, and then you press the other button. And then that message just gets sent to as many people as you pre-selected. So that mm. it works really well with internal communications because you can get a lot across in a short amount of time to a lot of people. With external communications, it's always been a little bit difficult. Like sometimes we'll use uh, Loom mm-hmm. to record videos and, and Loom's really popular, I think, to walk through documents and when you want to go through something uh, that's, yep. a, that's uh, heavy in detail. Um, we've... We've been exploring Bonjoro for a little while in yes. terms of uh, quick uh, uh, videos out to people. It doesn't require them to download anything, which is a really big positive over Marco Polo. 
And one thing that I've started doing now is if you can record your screen, like, and then it will give you a GIF, like a moving GIF of what you've just recorded. So if you've mm-hmm. gone onto someone's website, for example, and you're recording something about them and mm-hmm. you can show them in the GIF that it's actually their, their website with, with the video in built into the GIF. I think that's a really, it shows them that you've done the hard work to actually make something specifically for yeah. them. Yep. Um, so that's a really important thing. I haven't quite figured out how to use that really well yet, but the other Uh, because we're always looking at this sort of stuff. The other thing that we've recently come into contact with is it's created by Typeform. Now, Typeform's been around Mm -hmm. for a long time. It's called Video Ask. So, VideoAsk.com, it splits the screen like we're doing now in Zoom. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, and but it asks a question, right? So uh, so basically, if I was to create this for you, I'd say, "Hey, Paul, how's it going? Uh, Mate, here's question one, and then it will give you options." And you have to, you, you click on the option and then, and then I have two prepared set responses and let's say you pick option A and I go, okay, it's really good to know, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. In that case, uh, this, and then let's say my video is over. So, so I've given you a client journey with video and then mine's over. However, on that, at that exact moment, the other screen allows you to record. So my, now let's say I've sent it to you, you without downloading anything can just hit record and respond back That's however brilliant. you like yep. all in all in one screen. And, mm. and so the good, th- because obviously um, and it, especially if I say your name in it and I don't have to create a user journey, I don't have to create as data capture. I can just say, mm. Hey Paul, good to know that we've got this meeting coming up, mate, blah, 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 blah. If you've got exactly. anything you want me to know, just let me know by hitting record here. That, that two-way response, I think, is really interesting. So video ask is something that we're going to be spending a little bit of time getting our heads around as well. That's brilliant. I think that's a great application when someone books a meeting to say, hey, this is, I know who you are. Thanks for, so much for booking and I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Just that little personal touch is, is, is great. But the other thing, as you mentioned that, I thought this is a great way of capturing a, a testimonial from someone. Ah, right. So yeah. you, you send them, Hey, I lo- really loving working with you. And, you know, really pleased that we've gotten you these results and you reel off where they were before to where they are now. Hey, would you mind shooting a couple of sentences to say hey, what it's been like working with us and what it, what it has me- meant to your life. That's and so really, that's a great use of that product. Yeah. Hmm. Cause a vid- vid- video, obviously written testimonials are good. Then the next level up is a, vi- a testimonial with their face and, and like the number of stars maybe on Google or Facebook, but then a video testimonial probably trumps them all. And you can use that in, in your nurture series. You can use that on your, on your website, really, really valuable marketing collateral to have. That's yeah. Okay. That's really, really good, man. Um, a lot of this stuff you kind of have to, and, and this is why working with someone like you makes a lot of sense is because, uh, as, as let's say I'm the owner, put my advisor hat back on. I got a business I'm, I'm somewhat aware of a lot of this stuff, but it does take a long time to mm. sort of put it in the right, the right place. Yeah. So lead capture or, 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 or client acquisition now to me means so much more than it because I've thought about it and had so many conversations about it. But then now you've given me more to think about after this conversation. And I've sort of had a bit of a privilege where uh, like, I get to get better at my job by speaking to experts like you as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's difficult as someone who's not doing it 24 seven to be, okay, I've got this type of client journey for someone that's like this and this client journey for someone that's like this. But then once they get here, then it's all the same. And then at this stage, it splinters back off again. Mm -hmm. And it sounds over and it used to be overwhelmingly difficult as well. I remember only a handful of years, the only product that would allow you to do something like this was called Infusionsoft. Mm-hmm. And then you needed yep. a nuclear physicist to figure yeah. out how to use that, right? <laughs> like that was, right. but now there's all this mapping you can do with the if functions that are very easy to pick. And mm-hmm. I know Active Campaign, for example, is one of those that are really successful at that. Um, we use Zoho. We actually used ActiveCampaign for about four years. We've only recently moved across 
to Zoho. One thing here you go, I didn't know when you changed uh, when you changed email um, managers or whatever mm-hmm. they're called that the servers don't get entirely excited about this. And right. uh, and we've I, I wish I'd sent more smaller based emails than larger to begin with because okay, uh, yeah. That that was a that was a rookie move, man. Like, oh, yeah, we we pissed off. Why, why did you switch to Zoho? Because I remember we used to use Zoho before, maybe about five years ago. Then we switched to Sharp Spring, and then now to Active Campaign. But yeah. every every one of them has their own little nuances, and you really need to understand your use cases and yes. figure out what your requirements are, and you really need to dive into the nuts and bolts of what they deliver. Because you can often get to a point where you've implemented a CRM, and then you realize, oh shit. It just doesn't do this one thing, which is ruining everything for us. Yes. You have to be very clear about it. Yes. So the reason why is because we ended up as every company does, who's, uh, you know, sort of starting out and trialing a bunch of tech is we, we end up getting two, three, four thousand dollar bills a month, right. To mm. pay for everything that we were doing. And yep. we were zapping from one thing to the other, right. Trying to, and it was over time and, Again, that's why it makes sense to work with people that you to avoid all this. But over time, we sort of figured out what we wanted to achieve. It took us yeah. many years and it took us a lot of money. And then we, we started a project called um, Does Zoho Do It? <laughs> yep. And because I was blown away and I'm only just now getting my head around the amount of things that Zoho does. So Zoho mm. at some stage, and I can't tell when, have have – re-engineered their business so now that they're a platform and they just constantly produce new apps mm. right you can do anything with it. yeah it's pretty amazing so now they're just like every couple of months they're like here's a new thing we do here's a new thing we do. hey wait a second that's just slack hey mm. wait a second that's just this thing that i'm paying for over here and then now we've got a project on we're in the middle of this multi-month tech audit and the project is called Does Zoho Do It? So we're looking at uh, something on the expense line and can we find uh, the Zoho equivalent? Because we've realized that that's what Zoho wants to do. They want to mm. get, get you to pay your one small fee per person and then they've just got their developers just absolutely just piling on the amount of things that it does. Mm. It's amazing. And it's quite flexible too. You can go in and change things and, and everything build the different functionality that you need. So... Yeah, no, it's really a good option for that if you want to get really, really specialized into it. Definitely. And again, this is, this is, we started on MailChimp, went to Active Campaign, and uh, it's many years later that we're only just now going to Zoho. The, realistically, the only, way, the only place to go to from here would be Salesforce or something like mm-hmm. that. And I mean, yeah. I'm certainly knowing I'm not in any rush to spend a few it's thousand a dollars. More, a bit more pricey, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, so the tech thing is a huge journey, but it's a, it's an important journey. And essentially the better that advisors get at this, the, the, here's the thing that people don't talk about enough with marketing as well. The better you get at marketing is actually you get better at your financial advice because you learn how to articulate what it is that you do better hmm. and you learn and, and thus you know how to deliver on what solves your client's problems better. These right. are all really interesting uh, results to come off the back of spending time doing your marketing. You actually strangely end up becoming a better advisor. Yep. Actually, one of the first things we do is the ideal client profile and that's like a detailed breakdown of who you're speaking to and you might have se- several seg- segments of your potential customers, but you're wanting to really drill into those things. Like I mentioned before, what's keeping them up at night? What are their goals? What are their dreams? What does that mean to their life? What does it mean to their, you could even say, what does it mean to their identity? That they're going to be a good family man, that they're going to, um, you know, they're, they're going to be, be better than the neighbor next door or whatever it is that's driving that person. You want to understand that at a, at a granular level. And then, as you said before, you might have these different journeys, but you, you may want to tailor the messaging to different people. So the, the pre-retire, like the 55-year-old pre-retiree, is getting different messaging from someone who's in their 30s and has just had a um, had a promotion and they want to deal with what an increase in income or whatever it is. So you're breaking it up, and um, often relevance wins. So um, the more relevant your messaging can be, then the better it's going to perform. It goes yeah. back to that Google um, search. So if you someone searches for 
you know, we want to make granular experiences where possible and relevant experiences where possible. So if someone searches for financial, like take the two, two very popular keywords, financial planner and financial advisor. Both of those keywords are pretty, pretty similar search intent. They're looking for an advisor. But if you have an ad that says, like if you're targeting financial planner and then you have an ad that says financial planner in the copy of the ad and then the landing page that says financial planner, it's going to perform better than fi- saying financial advisor just because it's in their mind already. Yeah. Uh, so the more relevant you can make your messaging to the problems that are going on, the language and the, 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 the story that's happening in the, in the client's mind, then the better you, the whole thing is going to perform from end to end. Wow. Yeah. And you could, I mean, you could either do that at rudimentary in a rudimentary way by creating two landing pages with financial planner on one and financial advisor on the other. Right. Or there, I know that there's even dynamic text now that you can have yes. on websites that depending on where the, the link has come from, will update the wording that's used, which right. I, that was, that's like, man, that is plain God. How you come up with uh, dynamic text on a website? That is, that, do you, that, have you ever? A, yeah, no, we, we're doing that. That's actually wow. fairly easy. So you, you just say that. You say that, but it seems really difficult. Well, it, in a basic term, you add, so if you're um, like your website's financialplanner.com um, and you can, you add a, what's called a query string parameter to the URL. So you just add a, um, question mark and then the parameter so it could be location equals um inner sydney and if that's in the url then you've got another piece of script running on the page that pulls that parameter off the url and dynamically inserts it on the page so i'm experimenting with that at the moment is breaking adwords down into locations so when they search for certain suburbs we may put the suburb name on the landing page dynamically and i'm trying to figure out how to get the get my developer to, to do the ba- actual like background image. So if they search for <laughs> Surrey Hills, then you've got an image of Surrey Hills. Yeah. And again, it's back to the relevance, like back to the, back to them seeing something they understand that's, that's relevant to them and it may, gives them more trust. So, um, Man, yeah. that would be, that's high level right there. If you, if you could, if you can, that. yeah. Wow. That's, that's huge. That's awesome. Mm, it's going to be, I think it will, it will pay off actually doing that. Not a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. When, when, uh, this is something I talk to my team a little bit about as well. Like when, when someone clicks on something, you just want the next thing you look at to look and feel and sound almost identical because mm. everyone's so worried about getting hacked and getting re-diverted somewhere and yep. or, you know, or like ending up in a scam that if it even looks remotely different from the thing you clicked on to the thing that you ended up at, you, you've immediately got your backup. You're like, Oh, is this, mm-hmm. is this the thing? So you have to make sure that all of your designs and everything makes sense. So yeah, if you can down to the suburb with your dynamic uh, text on your website, my God, that is advanced stuff. That's good. Mm-hmm. Man, it's very cool. Hey, um, so uh, this this podcast will go out in a, in a couple of weeks because we're in the middle of a, 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 a mental health series at the moment. Cool. Um, but I, so by the time this goes live, your your web event would have already uh, been over. But cool. give us a quick rundown of what people can expect to go through uh, if they had been there, and um, and how do people find out more about what you're doing? Yep, we're going to cover how to develop a lead magnet that converts. So basically, basically like develop a, what we call an ethical bribe for someone to download in exchange for, for your right to open up a marketing relationship with them and start to market to them ongoing. Um, looking at um, Love Him or Hate Him, the barefoot investor, what he's done, he's got a, he, had, he used to have a really great lead magnet on his website. So I'm going to use that as a case study. He was converting about 1,000 people onto his list using that every month. Wow. Um, so there's some really compelling reasons why that his particular lead magnet was working. And I want to talk to people about why, and then give them an opportunity to uh, give them a framework for how to build a lead magnet. That's going to convert people onto their list and build up their subscriber database. So I think you're going to be able to find that in the XY platform. Yes, Maybe will you correct. have a recording of it? I don't know. Like Yes, yes. So we do all of our web events for the XY Plus community. It's just an additional thing that we do for value add for people that pay $30 a month. 
Um, but there will be undoubtedly some uh, blogs or, or other content written off the back of that. So I'm sure the wider community will still get access to, to the general uh, look and feel. And they'll certainly, this is, uh, this is free to air. So how do people find out more um, if they were to go search for you? Cool. Awesome. Uh, go to authenticadvice.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there or um, go into the Authentic Advice channel, the community in XY. Join there. That would be awesome to have you in there, um, posting in there regularly. Uh, I've got a course, Content Marketing Strategy for Financial Advisors, so you can build, help to get the framework to build an effective content strategy. Uh, or give me a call. Drop a, drop a request for, for a call on, at my website, and um, if you need a team to work with you, then we'll be happy to have a chat. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you in the communities. Awesome. Very cool. Well, it's been great to interview the Justin, you know, let's go, let's go with, <laughs> let's go with Ronaldo. Let's go with the Cristiano Ronaldo of the XY platform. Mate, uh, thank, thank you, you sir. For coming Cheers. On. Cheers. 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 Bye.